or no, no. Well, I am so grateful that you're here tonight. And for you students, this is for you. We'll let the older folks listen in, but I'm here uh, to speak to the students uh, at Warner Pacific. And I think there are a few who, weren't, who were not brave enough to come. So I applaud your braveness. I don't know that I would have done this when I was your age, which I should probably vet myself a little bit. Why am I here and what gives me any room to speak at all? Well, I, I went to a small Christian college myself. It's now called the Master's College. You might have heard of that in Southern California. Uh, I, I was there. I had a wonderful time. I was not there to do anything but to have a wonderful time. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I was just so happy to be away from home. And it was like I experienced freedom for the first time ever. And it was fabulous. I could make my own decisions. I could go shopping with my roommate, who had tons and tons of money. I don't know. I guess her father, he was a stockbroker or something. I had no money at all. But I wanted to be like her. And I, I found a way that I could do that. I did it with a checkbook. We didn't have credit cards back then. I know I look way, way too young to be able to even say that. But however, this is so true. And, and, but, but I did it with a checking account. I, I figured a way that I could have things today and pay for them tomorrow if I could find a way to get the money into the bank in time before the check cleared and all that kind of thing. And all too often, I got away with it. And then that became my way of life. Well, I did get through school. I actually graduated. I majored in music, of all things. And uh, my life was to begin... I thought when I married a rich man, because that was going to be my way into my life, that I would never have to worry about money or car trouble again, because that's what we think men are for, don't we, ladies? A little bit, just a tiny, tiny bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, guess what? I did. I did. I married a banker. Of all things, I married a banker. And did we ever discuss money, the two of us? Never, ever. Why would we do this? he might find that I'm not such a great catch after all. I, I had a problem with writing bad checks, which means writing a check for more money than you have in the bank. But I figured that would never happen again once we were married, and, and I saw no need to do that at all. Now, remarkably, I came out of school without any debt. Uh, student loans were, I think, pretty much unheard of. Um, there was something called NDSL, but I don't remember at all what that was like. And school just was not as costly as it is now. It was possible to work your way through even a Christian college, a private school. Came out with absolutely no debt. My husband had no debt. And uh, he is a very conservative banker, thought we should stay that way. So he did not take kindly to me the day that I informed him that we really needed to get a credit card. He said, no, we will not get a credit card. We don't need a credit card. And you know, this was back before credit cards were such a great big deal, but to me it was. And well, I worked on him a little bit, you know, ladies, as we can do. We have influence, don't we? Oh, she's laughing. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, finally, after a couple of weeks, he agreed this would be OK. We could get a credit card. And so he filled out the application and sent it in. And sure enough, in the mail came my very first credit card with my married name on it, Mrs. Harold Hunt. And it had a great big red star because it was for the Texaco Gasoline Company. Now, that is not exactly the credit card I had in mind, you know. <laughs> but let me tell you something. Let me tell you what a, what a real uh, smart woman can do with a Texaco credit card. See, the money that I was supposed to be using to buy gas with cash so I could go to work every day, I figured it was now my money. Uh, oh, I'd use the credit card to pay for the cash, for the gas, and then I would have the cash for myself. I instantly gave myself a huge raise, and it was fabulous, just fabulous, until the first bill started to come. I have to tell you that my very, very happy marriage um, turned a little bit sour quite early when my husband realized that he couldn't trust me, and I realized I couldn't share all the truth with him. I learned how to make life happier at home by keeping things secret. Because I could not give up this thing inside of me that just had to have more and more. And it didn't matter how I got it. It's just that I had to have more and more and more. I, I don't know if it's an addiction. I suppose you, are there some psychology students here? I don't know. I might be a test case that you would absolutely love to work with. But, but all I can tell you is that the pain of him finding out 
was horrible. But it did not come close to matching the great euphoria I received when I could go out and buy whatever I wanted and put it on credit. I, I don't know how to explain that, but I can promise you this, it was not good. After 12 years of this, you can only imagine what our lives were like. A couple of things had happened to us during those two years. Uh, we had uh, some emergencies. Their names are Jeremy and Joshua. We had two little boys, and now I had a whole new thing in my life that required money. We had debts on top of debts. I had credit card debt my husband did not know about. He had refinanced our house so many times that we kind of lost track of that. He was in the, he was in the finance industry, so he, he knew how we could do all of that kind of thing. And we had nothing. And I'll never forget that day. It was September the 17th, and I shouldn't tell you how long ago, because some of you were not even born, <laughs> but it was in 1982 that my life came crashing down on me. He'd left the bank at my behest because I told him he'd never make enough money to support us, that he needed to find a job that would make more money, and he tried to do that. And we got into a self-employment kind of thing. And that crashed and burned, and there was nothing left. Our home was ready to go through foreclosure, and that was something that no one had ever heard of before. <laughs> foreclosure, you know, it was unheard of. But we were ready to lose our home. We had no money. Do you hear me? We had no unemployment checks. We had no savings. We had no investments. We had nothing. We had no income. We had no jobs. We had nothing. And we'd come to the end of the credit because no one could trust us there either. I had screwed things up so badly. I got in the car and just drove away because I didn't know what to do. What do you do? I'm not talking to my husband. He's scared to death. We're going to lose the house. I'm just sure he's going to divorce me. He's going to take the kids. What, what do I have left? Ended up at my mother-in-law's home. Went in there. She wasn't home. I was all by myself. And I think that's exactly where I needed to be because I had a meltdown. I, I don't know what else to call it when you fall out of the chair flat on the floor on your face right there in the kitchen floor and thank goodness she's a good housekeeper. <laughs> and for the first time, I realized it wasn't my husband. It wasn't his employer. It wasn't that I was born into a poor family. It wasn't that I'd never had an inheritance or won the lottery. It was none of those things. It was me. It was me. It was my deceitful heart. It was that horrible thing inside of me that could never have enough. And all of a sudden, I realized I needed to look up because there was nothing where I was looking down. And for the first time, I realized it was like God had turned on the floodlights of heaven and just showed in my heart what a terrible, horrible thing I had done. And now you're probably going to think she's going to have an encounter with the Lord. She's going to become a believer. You know, she's going to see. Well, let me tell you something. I was born into a pastor's family. I knew every verse and scripture and every lesson and everything there is to know about the, the Bible and salvation. And I truly, I accepted Christ as my Savior as a very, very young child. But I had never, ever, I don't believe, allowed him to invade my life. It was stuck in my head. And that day, as I lay there on the floor, I made God a promise. I don't know that we're supposed to make wages, wagers with him, but I did. And I said, if you will let me keep my husband, my home, and my kids, I will do anything to pay back this debt. I will do it until it's all paid back. And I, as you will change me, I promise that I will change. I will never do this again. Well, let me tell you, that was a powerful, powerful promise. That was in 1982. Got up from the floor, went home. Don't know how exactly I got there because I don't really remember. I was a broken woman. My husband and I still were not speaking. We still did not know what to do. There wasn't a pile of money on the, on the porch. And by the way, let me tell you, I uh, didn't know it at the time, but we've reconstructed and know that I had run up more than a hundred thousand dollars in credit card bills and unsecured consumer debt. Now, did you hear the year? 1982, it was a long time ago. You finance majors, economics majors, you know that in today's dollars, that would be closer to two, 250, maybe even more. Interest rates are much higher now than, than they were then. We went through some high interest rate periods, but I'm, I'm telling you people, it can get a hold of anybody. It took us 12, and it took me 12 years to make the mess. It took us 13 years to pay it back. But we paid back every single dime. 
and the things I did to pay it back because I meant it when I said I would do anything. Here we have two little boys, no jobs. Number one, I went back to work, was just not exactly what I had in mind when I told the Lord I would do that. I thought my husband should go get a job and I would do everything to keep a nice house and make sure dinner was ready. Every, I wasn't, no, I went back to work. And I took on so many extra jobs, you can't believe the things I did. I cleaned houses. I took in ironing. I ironed my friend's husband's shirts, okay? Talk about lowly kind of work. I, I became a process server. I would go into the pretty tough areas of Santa Ana, California, where we lived, and I would be the one that would hand out the subpoenas and try to get people come to come to the door and, you know, serving them with their divorce papers. Or It wasn't criminal, but it was scary. I did that. I, I didn't care what it was. I learned to pay back debt. It was joyful. It was the best thing that's ever happened to me. It turned my life around. And at the end of 13 years, yeah, I started writing this little newsletter. It was called Cheapskate Monthly. I did it simply to raise the balance, the final amount that we needed to pay off the debt. But God had something else in mind. And that little newsletter went on to get kind of big. Oprah Winfrey called, Dr. Dobson called, and that's how I got on all these. I, I didn't plan to do this. You marketing majors are just going, it's not supposed to happen like this. Oprah doesn't usually call you, but that's what happened. I'm telling you something. God has something amazingly in mind for you. He cares about money. Money is the way that he blesses us and gives us so that we don't have to walk around naked and we have food to eat. He blesses us. He wants to trust us, but he's got things in mind as for our futures as stewards. And I truly, truly believe those whom he can trust. He's going to give great sums to manage for the kingdom. And that's what this is all about tonight. I know that a good number of you are in school. I don't know what year you're in. I do know that it's April. It's almost time to be out for summer. Can you hardly wait? When does school get out? When is graduation? In another month, maybe? May? Yeah, yeah, it's getting here soon. Your four years are going to be gone so fast. And I hope that you'll be able to look back on tonight, which would be April the 9th, 2014, as maybe a place where your life took a little turn because you learned some stuff you didn't know before or stuff you knew before became more meaningful to you and you made a decision because it's not too late ever I don't care what situation you're in right now God wants to be able to trust you with money I know that every day it's a test and a trust he wants to know if he can trust you because he's looking for stewards we absolutely know that now let's talk a little bit about real life I brought with me a little handout. Now, has anybody in their heart said, oh, bless her, I love her, I love her? No PowerPoint. Did anyone say that? <laughs> no 67 slides. None. In fact, you have things to take notes, and I'd, it'd be great if you want to, but you don't have to. Truly. I've got something else in mind. But I, I, want, I want to have someone pass these out. I brought a simple paper handout that we're going to talk about tonight. And I hope this is just gonna turn on some floodlights for you. The reason I'm here tonight, I'm sure you think it's because I absolutely love and adore LRAP and I want to further the work they're doing and get as many schools and people involved in this because it's such a fabulous thing. And, and, and yeah, that kind of is on my list, but it's not number one. I'm here because I have a passion for college students for 23 years, I have been repairing adults who messed up and got themselves into horrible debt. I have led thousands of people out of debt. I have helped so many people learn how to manage their money. And I'm talking people in my own age group, usually. I mean, it, it's like my audience has grown with me and aged with me. Well, guess what? I have a new passion. I'm tired of repairing people. I want to start preparing students and young people to, so you don't make these horrible mistakes that you have to take out 10 or 15 years of your life to fix, okay? So I want you to look right now at this little handout. I'll get one here myself. And I've called this the critical decision point in a healthy financial future. Now, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. You can probably figure this out, but let's walk through this. I want to tell you this should be titled this is your life, okay? 
all of you. This is your life. Let's start here at age zero. There you are, so cute. Daddy's a little princess. Everything she wants and doesn't have to worry about a thing. Start to grow. And you can see that green line that's called the individual financial condition. Now, you know, this is arbitrary. I just picked this out. But it, it, it points to the fact that your life as a child, you didn't worry about money. Typically, you did not. Your food was paid for, you got to go to preschool, you got to go to summer camp, you had Christmas and birthdays and all of that kind of thing. And to you, that's what life was like. And so you head into these college years. Now that green bar, I'm telling you, this is, this is so pivotal in your life. This is where you are right now. These are your college years. Now, I want you to, in your mind's eye, make a couple more starbursts. You see that great big red one, but let's make two or three smaller ones. Let's make them, you know, a lovely shade of yellow, something not quite so bold as this. And I want you to like place them on that line in your college years. These are decision points. I call them critical decision points where you are making a decision that is going to affect you in the future. It's different than buying a cup of coffee at Starbucks. A critical decision point usually has to do with obligating future money. It, it could be a, a car loan. It could be a personal loan. It could be a credit card that you get that you decide to start using and realize you can't pay the whole thing off every month and so you have to make only the minimum payment. These are critical decision points. It, it could be getting engaged. It could be changing your major. It could be any number of things. Uh, a, a really bad one would be, it could be dropping out of school. But these are called critical decision points. Most of them have to do with money. Why is that? Money is so foundational in our lives. And I don't know anything about your, your college catalog at this school. But I'm just wondering if you have a mandatory, co mandatory course called Personal Finance 101 that you have to take. I don't know, is there such a thing here? Maybe not. I know this school is preparing you very, very well for your careers. But guess what? Without that foundation, to, phew, that could just be gone. You could mess up so quickly, so fast, it, it's scary to me. And I'll tell you why it's scary, because every day of my life, my, my mailbox loads up with stories of people who did this, they, they, they came to a critical decision point and did not have enough financial intelligence to make a good decision. And so let's see what happens. Now, the big red starburst. How many seniors here? How many are gonna graduate in May? I'm talking to you right now, okay? I call this critical decision point, that the, the big mother one here, the big one that is going to encompass about six weeks after graduation. <sighs> I graduated, I know the feeling, you know? I've driven this old clunker long enough. I'm not gonna drive an old car anymore. I deserve a new car. Boom, a new car or a new lease. I'm tired of living at home. I'm gonna go out and lease an apartment with my, with my roommate. Um, I'm gonna get some new clothes. I got this new credit card. I'm gonna put my student loans in forbearance or depression or whatever you can put them into. What's the other one? Deferment, deferment, the same thing, don't you think? <laughs> I'm telling you, those decisions that you will make right around your graduation stand to change the course of your life and possibly forever, because look at that. What happens is everything starts going downhill. Instead of going on the green light towards financial freedom, everything starts to take a plunge, and down it goes. And it's taking my breath away, because you can tell that this speaks to me. Do you see that blue dotted line? Mm-hmm, that's me. See, what I'm saying is that if you make a bad decision and you head downwards on this red line, it's not the end of the world. You can recover, but you've got to do it soon. And the longer you wait, the more difficult it's going to be. That's why I put that line about halfway down because that's how long it took for me to wake up and realize on September the 17th, 1982, this is out of control. I I'm gonna end down there with debt, bankruptcy, divorce, and depression. 
And so that was a turning point for me. And I have to tell you, and my husband, by the way, yes, 44 years married. Our marriage lasted. We made it. But it was hard. It was hard 13 years. It's been, it was joyful to, to, to get there, but it was like climbing Half Dome. Anybody ever been there? You know those la you know the cables at the end? Now I have to admit I've never been up them, but I've seen pictures. My husband did it. He told me how hard it is, and I believe it. So what I'm saying is, if anybody thinks, "Oh yeah, I'll just I, I can just make these lousy decisions. Anything goes wrong, I'll just come back." Oh, it's so hard. It is so hard. But the worst thing is, is that gray part. What does it say? Let's say it out loud, everybody. Forever lost opportunity. Who knows what this is going to be? Will it be having to turn your back on what God has called you to do? You know, if you're planning to be a missionary and that mission board will not take people who are, who are in this state, you know, what's it going to be? Will it be the love of your life saying, I can't marry you? You have so much debt. You have gotten yourself in such a mess. I can't be part of this. I don't know what it will be, but I don't want you to find it. Now, there's another op option here, and that would be the gold line or orange line there, the squiggly one. And, and this would be the person or the couple, the family, who catch themselves, but it, they don't go back. They just status quo, just tread water. And it's called daily financial struggle for the rest of their lives. Now, let's look at these ages here. I mean, th those two, from age 22 to 30, that was the time. I mean, this, this is my life. <laughs> Let me just say it. But, but I have seen this repeated in so many situations. And look at, look at the age 40, the couple now turning gray and old. Isn't that funny? Did you, do you like my choice of colors? This is when they're having children now ready to go on to college. This is when they should be getting ready for their own retirement. What, you know, I hate to tell you, your parents are not going to be able to work forever. And this is very, very scary. And there are people in the 50s, 60s who are still on the squiggly line. People, I don't want you on the red line, on the squiggly line, or even on the blue dotted line. I want to help you stay on the green line. Do you see that? Staying on the green line is hard work but it's nothing compared to those other options. And so the sacrifices that it will require, the frugality you must live under, what you must do to learn how to manage money and grow your financial intelligence, you have to do this. You have to be a walking expert on everything from credit scores to credit cards to uh, investing to returns on invest, everything like that. And it's not hard, uh, listen. I'm a music major. That is about the last person in the world you would ever expect to fall in love with this whole subject of personal finance. But I have. I've got this amazing passion. I, I am so thrilled to be here tonight. If, if I could just touch one person's life and make a difference, it would be worth all of it that we've been through. And so for the rest of our time together, what we're going to do is talk about how you can stay on that green line. It is not difficult. I've had to teach this to myself. And for 23 years, I've been in my own little school of learning personal finance. And it's so much fun. I absolutely love it. I've written a lot of books. And I think it was about a year ago, no, maybe six months ago, this book came out. It's called, it is called The Seven Money Rules for Life. Let me tell you the premise behind this. You can imagine after 23 years of doing this, uh, you know, I had, I, I think that I've counted up on my website alone, just in the archives, I have written more than 4,600 words, which, you know, if you're talking about book length, is 45,000 words for a book. That's about 89 books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get real wordy about this. And so one day I was just trying to think, it was before I did this book, could I boil it all down? Could I boil it all down to something that would be simple, that we could just talk about in a 45-minute session together? Is it something that I could actually memorize? And I, this was the test. This was the biggest test of all. Could I possibly 
teach someone how to manage money in few enough words that it would fit on the back of a business card. Now, I'm talking about a regular size business card, now, you know, not, a, not a billboard size. And so that's what I set out to do. And that is what this book, now this book is a few more words than that, but I had to explain it, okay? So in the time that remains, just to prove to you that this is simple, I want to teach you the seven money rules for life. That's why we don't have PowerPoint. I don't want this to get all confusing. I don't want to have bullet points. I don't want to have a 12 point type, you know, and, and, and 67 slides. It's not that tough. And here's the challenge. We got a smart girl back here, right here in the pink. I bet you she could, nope, that'd be you. <laughs> Sweetheart, I think you could learn the seven money rules of life before you go home tonight. Will you try? <laughs> She's ready to go, guys. She's gonna put you all to shame. All right, so here we go. Now, you can keep notes or you can just keep it in your head. But I promise you, there will be a test. Okay? The first money rule for life. Do not spend money. Do not spend more money than you earn. I couldn't even get through the first one without stumbling. <laughs> Let's try that again. <laughs> Don't spend more than you earn. I mean, is that just kind of like common sense? But you want to know something? This statistic just blows my mind, but this is, you know, whoever puts statistics together, 43% of American households spend more than they earn every year. 43%. Whew, that's tough. You have to stop doing this. You can't spend money you don't have. You have to make this a rule for life. Don't spend more money than you earn. There's lots of ways to do that. And it's a challenge, especially if you have let yourself go into a position where you are spending more. You're part of the 43%. Especially if you've obligated yourself to a lot of legal debt. By law, you have to pay back. It's not going to turn it around overnight. But I can tell you that if you make more than $10,000 a year, you do have at least a few pennies where you have discretion over where they go. And so I want to give you permission that you can start now to make better decisions. That's what we're all about at Debt Proof Living. Every day, for the last 12 years, every weekday, I have written a column of 500 words. Now, got any writers in here? That is a lot of work. <laughs> every, every, day, every weekday for 12 years, simple ways that people can save time and money every day. It's the best thing I've ever done because it keeps me focused. But you can do this. You can make a commitment right now. I'm going to stop spending money. If we don't have it, we're not going to spend it. That's huge, huge, but not too big. It's going to keep you on that green line. The second money rule for life, you ready? You must always save some. Or you can even, you can shorten that to always save some. Three words, always save some. What this means is that money that flows into your life and I, as a believer, truly believe that it comes from God. It's not mine. Everything we have is on loan. We're stewards. We are managers. Some of you run corporations. Some of you are managed departments. Matt runs the best corporation in the whole world called LRAP. Yes, he does, assisted by the lovely Rachel. You know how to do this. Some of you run homes. You're, you, you're a, a housewife. Others of you run farms or, you know, on the summertime. I don't know. Some of you are going to be on a cruise. I don't know what you're going to do. But you know how to manage things. And you know that when you're given the response, that's what it is, folks. God sends money into your life every day as a test to see if you will honor him with it. Will you be a good steward? You know? When you go into debt, what you're doing is you are reaching into the future, spending money you've not yet earned in order to pay for something today. And so then we need to talk about that, and we will in a bit. But I just want to say this. Everything that comes into your life, you need to first of all save some. You know, if your grandma sends you a check, or no, how, how do grandmas send money now? To school. Buy a check? Yeah, or you know, I don't know, PayPal or whatever. You know what? You need to put some of it away. You need to have a place where you absolutely always put savings. 
if you put it away, let me tell you why saving money is so important. It takes care of one of our common emotions. Most of us, it, at some time in our life, experience fear. Fear of running out of money. Fear of not having enough money. Fear is a gripping, bad emotion. The Bible says that God, a fear does not come from God. So it doesn't come from him. You know, we've got to say, where does it come from? It, it's, it's because of the decisions that we make. And so if you are always saving, always make that a rule of life, you'll never be broke. You will always have that. And it quiets that fear, which I think is a good thing to do. Put your fears to rest. Rule number three, always give some away. Always. Let me tell you about this. I told you I grew up in a pastor's family, so of course, you know, my father being a Baptist pastor, giving was a very important thing. Tithing, we had all of these rules at, you know, church things and all. And yes, I could have preached many, many sermons on this. I, I knew the, the principle. And as I've grown older and, you know, my father is now gone and I've tried to move from a place of legalism to grace. You know, I've really, really searched the Bible, and, and I realized that there were very, very strict rules in the Old Testament having to do with tithing. But as I look at the New Testament, it's not there. I, I can't find anywhere where Jesus commanded us to tithe. Instead, he said, I want you to be generous. God loves a generous giver. I want you to bless others as I've blessed you. And so I think that, that that is just so freeing to me. And I, I tell you, the most wonderful thing in the whole world is when I have enough money that when I hear of a need, I can just pff, write out a check. That is such a fabulous feeling. Now let me tell you what giving will do in your life. Giving will slay the other monster that's going to bring you down, and it's called greed. Because when you're giving, it's, it, that is a form of gratitude. We give out of gratitude. We give because we've been blessed. We, we give to bless others. And I'm telling you something, you cannot feel greedy and grateful at the same moment. And so if you have trouble with greed, which, hello, I'm the first one. You know, when I would go on my shopping sprees and I found that great pair of shoes at Nordstrom, do you think I was only satisfied with one pair? No, I had to have them in all four colors. Uh, you know, it, it, greed. We live in a greedy society. We do. You know, the pull of the culture is so strong on us. And sometimes we have to just push it away. I'm telling you, always give some. Now, say you don't see a need right now. Fine, put some away. Every time money comes into your life, put some away. God's going to bring those needs to you. And, you know, I, I, I'm sorry if I'm treading on any toes, but, you know, I, I don't think the percentage is so important. I think it's the attitude of our hearts. And I can promise you, from my own experience, giving releases God's supernatural intervention into your finances. I don't know how to explain it. But I'll tell you something, it, it's, it's the best thing on earth that I have ever experienced. I could tell you so many stories, and I don't want to do that because, you know, I don't think we're supposed to boast I don't think that God even, he, I mean, he wants us to give in secret, you know. I, I'll tell you, there was a time that I had planned that when I got very wealthy, and this is back when my husband was going to be a millionaire, um, that I, I was going to give. I would start giving then, and this is the truth. I was going to give a grand piano to my church, a 12-foot grand piano. Now, that's the concert grand and of course, it would be up on the stage, you know, the day that the gift would be announced, and it'd be covered by a black tarp or something. And then I would come out in a gown, and I would sit down and play, because of course this would be the de dedication, because I'm the pianist. And then they would make this whole thing that it had been donated by Mr. and Mrs. Harold Hunt, you know. That's not the kind of giving I think God's looking for. And, and I'm ashamed to say that my heart and my mind ever went there. All right, rule number three, always give some away. I, I can tell you that even though I said that's percentage thing, and, and I meant that, that I don't think God's up there with a cash register, 9%, banish you. <laughs> you know, I don't think that. But I, I think a good formula, if you want one, 
just write down 10, 10, 80. 10, 10, 80. Whatever comes into your life, save 10%, give 10% away, and rein your lifestyle in to fit within 80% of your income. Now, that's easy to say. And for those of you who have not messed up your lives yet, it's a wonderful thing to start doing. But if you're already living way beyond your means, we're going to have to do some things to pull that all back. But still, it remains. Never spend more than you, uh, never spend more than you earn. Give some away. I got them in out of order. Save some, give some away. OK. Rule number four, anticipate. Anticipate. It's simple. But so many of us don't do it. We think that the bills we have in our bill file right now, and if you don't have a home yet, or you probably don't have one, but you will someday, the bills I have due right now are all that I have to pay this month. Well, I need to do food and gas and all, but that's it. And we tend to forget, sorry, we tend to forget that every day we're wearing out the tires on our car. Did you ever think about that? <laughs> a little bit at a time. You're wearing out the brakes. Uh, every day, Christmas is coming one day closer. Um, every day, your parents are getting older. Your great uncle is on death's door, and you need to go to his funeral. You know, I mean, it's coming. These things, I call them irregular and unexpected and intermittent expenses. Some of you have them in the form of car insurance that's due every quarter or maybe uh, twice a year. You don't have it every month. Still, these are expenses that we need to plan. So you need to learn how to anticipate. This is a big, this is an important tenant of debt-proof living. We have something uh, that I created called a freedom account. That, I mean, you don't go to the store and buy a freedom account. You create one yourself, but this is what it's for. It's a separate bank account where you are every month treating these irregular things like regular expenses and putting away one-twelfth of the annual expense. For instance, if you're, um, let's say you want to spend $1,200 on Christmas. Is that outlandish? I'm, I'm looking for a round number here. Oh, let's say $600 on Christmas. You can't wait until December 15th, or else you're going to go running to the credit cards to pay for Christmas. So you need to be putting aside how much? $50 every month, so that when Christmas comes, you've got it. You, got to, you understand? There's some uh, older people who remember the old Christmas clubs. Remember that? Oh, you can't be that old. You remember that? OK, all right. <laughs> where the bank would do this for you. This is before credit cards. And honestly, I have called many retailers and tried to find out why, I don't mean retailers, banks, why they stopped doing the credit, uh, Christmas clubs. And they said, you know, once credit cards became so available, people no longer were interested. Because now they didn't have to worry about it. Just wait until Christmas comes and use the credit card if you're all right. But you can do this yourself, and you should be. You should be doing it for your auto insurance, for your life insurance, for anything that comes intermittently. And this, what this does is it turns it into a regular monthly bill you can anticipate. And you know, and then you can plan for it. Which leads us to rule number five, right? All right, here it is. You have to tell your money where to go. OK? When you get your paycheck, when you get anything that comes into your life, you need to make a plan. Now, th this is the best way I can understand it. I have a simple mind. I, I, I can't understand the complicated parts of personal finance and economy, but I can understand this. Every dollar that comes into my life is like a staff person, an employee. And so if I get $100, I've got 100 employees that I need to manage. Uh, I just can't let them come to work and sit and do nothing. They have to have a job to do. And so before I ever ch cash that check, I need to assign a job to every single dollar that comes into my life. Now, uh, I, this next word I'm going to say gets stuck in my throat. I, I'm just a, I hate it. Budget. Anybody like that <laughs> word? Budget. <laughs> it's what I heard so many years of my life when the last thing I wanted anyone to talk to me about was, you need to get on a budget. But that's what a budget is. It's just a plan. It's a way that you pre-spend your money. You make a plan. If you get $400 from your paycheck or $430.02, 
Before you do one thing, you need to write down exactly where it's going to go. How much is going to go into your saving envelope? How much into your giving envelope? You've got your car payment due, or you've got this or that, or you've got a hot date, or you know whatever it is. And I can pretty much promise you that all of the needs that you have is going to be far greater than the amount of money you have. And so you have to start, you know, go back, erase it all, start again, start again. You've got too many jobs and not enough employees. Or you've got to find out a way to get more employees. But that's all a budget is. It's you deciding. It's not anybody else deciding. And your budget can change every single month. Now, there are some people who like to use online apps. There are fabulous ones out there that can make this so much easier. But most of them, let me warn you, like Mint. How many of you use Mint? Mint.com? Oh, my goodness. Oh, boy, we have a lot of work to do. Um, what an app like Mint.com is free, and I would say it's a very good one. What it does is it actually attaches to your bank account, and you can attach it to also your credit card so that every, and your debit card, every time you do anything, boom, you can see it right on Mint. You can see exactly where your money is going. The only thing I don't like about that is only after the fact. You need a method by which you can plan ahead. And so you're smart, and I so, know some of you can go on and find other apps that will help you do this. So just make your own. Do it on your notepad on your iPhone or something. Just write down where that money is going to go. You're going to feel like a manager, which is exactly what you are. And you may take hours and hours to try and figure this out. Some of your expenses are going to have to wait. You're going to have to work some more hours. You're going to have to get another job. You're going to have to give up eating every, out every night instead of going to the cafeteria where you've already paid for your meals, which I understand is a problem in some colleges. Yes. I won't be too hard on you. Or, you know, you're going to have to send back all that stuff you ordered from Amazon. Whatever it is, you've got to become a good manager. You have to get yourself in line, okay? So that was rule number five. Here comes rule number six. Learn to manage your credit. You have to become a credit manager. And now I'm going to meddle, and I'm going to step on some toes, but I'm just going to come right out and say it. There are some people, uh, and, and I hear from them all the time, who tell me I don't wish to have a credit score because I don't want to get any debt, and all debt a credit score is is a debt score that and a credit report. All that does is keep track of how much debt you have, and I want to have a zero credit score and not participate in that part of life. Well, good luck. Sadly, I mean, that'd be great if it was possible. It's not possible in this country anymore. Listen, your credit score is something that the world has foisted on us that we can't get away from. And let me tell you why. When you go to rent an apartment, you know what, the, you know what that landlord's going to do the first thing? They're going to pull your credit report because they're going to see how you manage your life. They think of that as a character reference. If you don't pay your bills, if your score is very low because you've got way more debt than you can possibly handle on your income, why in the world are they going to want to lease a rent apartment to you? You probably won't pay them either. Okay? Another place that you're going to, this is going to pop up in your life is when you apply for that job. Employers now are doing this. And I'll tell you why. I am an employer. I sure don't want to hire someone who can't manage their own money. Why would I let them take care of mine? How can I trust somebody who lies to their creditors? Why would I want them to work for me? And so you can see those things have nothing to do with debt. It has to do with character. And I wish I could tell you there was a way to get out of that system, but there is not. So what you need to do is become the best manager in the world of your own credit. No one else cares about your credit report than you, and I promise you. There are statistics out there. I've read them that up to 70% of all credit files, which you do have one, at least, probably three, have mistakes in them. Now, if there's a mistake in there that you haven't corrected, and you go to apply for that fabulous job and don't get it because you had a terrible credit file, that, that's not fair. But that's what's going to happen. So you, right now, tonight, need 
to step into the role of being your own credit manager. Let me tell you how to do this. While there are thousands of credit gathering agencies, that's what they're called, credit gathering agenc agencies, there are only three you need to worry about or know about, okay? Three, nationwide, here they are. They're called Equifax, they're called Experian, and TransUnion. Each of them have a credit file on you, and there was a time when it actually was in a drawer, and it was a paper file. And as information came in, they would put it into that file. That is old hat now. It's all electronic. It's all done. Every creditor out there reports to these agencies every month because it's a big industry. It's not government regulated, although the government has come in and put some rules, but it's private industry, and they do this. The creditors pay the credit agencies to come up with the information so they can know who they're dealing with. So here's the deal. You have a right by federal law, recently enacted law, that you have the right to see what everyone is saying about you and your credit file. It's like a rap sheet, and you need to think of it that way. This is what people are saying. It may not be true. You could have stuff in there that has nothing to do with you, especially if you have a name similar to your parents. If you're a junior, you could have all of your dad's really bad credit in your file. You could, and you need to figure this out. And your dad could have all your really bad credit in his file. So what you need to do, write down this uh, website, annual credit report, singular, dot com. Annual credit report dot com. Those three big agencies were required by law to open this website and to offer to you a free copy of everything that's in your file from each one of these big three every 12 months. So I would recommend, if you've never done it before, you need to go to annualcreditreport.com and you need to order. Now this is a portal. This is where you go in. If you were to go straight to transunion.com, you're going to pay probably $15 or $20 to get your, your uh, report. You don't want to do that. So you go through the portal, annualcreditreport.com. Let me warn you. After you're in there and say who you are and you can identify yourself, they're going to send you then. You'll automatically go to those other websites. Those people are going to try and get you to pay. Don't do it. Just keep saying no thanks, no thanks. You will work your way through. You don't have to give a credit card, nothing. You need to get these. You will get it instantly by email, your report on each one. With it will come information on how to correct bad information, like if there's mistakes on there. I do have to tell you that by law, you cannot get anything taken off your credit report that is correct, even if it's bad. Okay? Very important that you get it cleaned up. Now here's what the law also says. You can dispute anything that you don't know factually to be true. Now you could doubt something. I don't remember ever having a bill at JCPenney. Well, dispute it. If you don't remember, truly, honestly, you want it off of there. If they don't search and give you the truth within 30 days by law, they're supposed to take it off. Do they always do that? No, you might have to ask them a dozen times. You can see you've got a new little job here. You have to get control of your credit reports. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but some of you are engaged to be married. I have a little assignment. I want you on your next date to exchange your credit reports. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's a lot of things we can hide. You can't hide it from your credit report. Credit reports also talk about tax liens, evictions, um, um, arrests, jail time. Yeah, you want to find out about a person, look at their credit report. This is why it's so important you make sure everything on there is correct, okay? Now, a credit score is something that is done with computers. A company called FICO decided that they could come up with algorithms and all kinds of, you know, computer stuff that by listing the stuff in a credit report, they could come up with a three-digit number that would then translate to the credit worthiness of that person based upon what's in that report, okay? There are uh, dozens of scoring companies. TransUnion, Equifax, Experian, they all have their own, and their ranges are all different. Some of the ranges go up to 950, down to 250. Some go from 350 to 800. You know, none of them go to zero. So if anybody says they have a zero, it's not possible. As lowest you could have would be 350 on this range, on scoring range, and 250 on that one, okay? 
I would recommend that you only care about your FICO score. And you can find that at my FICO, F-I-C-O, which stands for the Fair Isaac Company, who created this thing, dot com. Now, unlike your credit report, the law does not allow you to have a free credit score yet. But I understand that's coming. For now, if you want to know what your credit score is, you're going to have to pay about $16 to get it. I wouldn't waste the money unless you're going to be you know, applying for an apartment in a couple of months, or you're going to be applying for a job or something. Uh, if you've got something coming up and you want to know, you know. The, the, but a credit score is like a snapshot. It could be one number today and another number tomorrow, depending on if you paid your credit down or, you know, if you took on new debt or all kinds of things can happen. But anyway, th that's just basically how you manage your own credit. You need to do this. If you're married, you and your spouse need to both do this. Anybody looking at your stuff, if you're going to apply for a mortgage to buy a home, they're going to average your scores. So, if, you know, if you're counting on your husband's great score uh, to hide your lousy one, <laughs> well, it ain't going to happen. You're going to have to average them. So th that's how we're going to deal with the, with the um, managing your own credit. And by the way, we'll have time, I think, a few minutes for questions. So if you have any, we'll take them at the end. Which now we're going to come to rule number seven. Here we go, guys. Brace. Do not borrow more money than you know you can repay. Now, how do you know that you can repay? Uh, technically, there's no way to know. Only God would know that. But in this human text context, the way that I would say this, you know out of being reasonable and uh, if a loan has collateral, uh, that makes it far more likely that you can repay because you had to qualify. But can you know that 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 you can repay? No. But you understand what I'm saying? You have to have a plan. You have to have a reasonable plan where you look and you say, I'm going to put, you know, this, this prom dress, you know, proms, you know, this whatever on this credit card, and, and I'm going to pay it off in two months because I'm going to pay the, you know, $100 here and $125 here, and it'll be paid off, and I've got this plan. Now, I'm not saying that I could get behind that plan, but at least you've got a plan to do it, okay? Buying a house is pretty much taken care of because no one's going to lend you more money than on paper and statistically they know you can repay. Similar with a car, although cars can be, mm, because cars do not appreciate. They lose value, so you can be upside down so fast. Now let's talk about the one that's on everyone's mind, the student loans. Let's talk about it. How do you know that you know that you know that you can repay? And how much is that? I want to interject something here. I, I'm not... I don't claim to be a Bible scholar, but I've spent an awful lot of time in this, and I've, I've talked to some very, very wise people, and I, I cannot find any place in God's word where borrowing money is forbidden. Debt is not forbidden. But God has an awful lot to say about it. First of all, if you borrow, you should borrow the least amount to get by, and you should pay it back so quickly your head spins most important thing on your mind to get it paid back, not to let it drag on. And yes, in Proverbs, it does say the borrower becomes the slave of the lender. But does it say not to do it? No. Is the relationship forbidden? No. But it's sure uncomfortable. Now, let me tell you why I think that it's not forbidden. Because God says those he bless with enough money, he will double bless if they lend to others. Not give to others, lend to others. And it talks about this lending relationship and how God blesses those who have enough to lend to others. So if, if debt were forbidden and a sin, how could the lender be blessed to be complicit in that sinful act? Now, I don't think that that's trying to explain anything away. But let's get back to your student loans. Oh, well, let's talk about my buying a house. My husband and I could have never, ever bought a house if we would have not been able to have a mortgage. That's a debt. But it was reasonable. We were able to pay it off. 
We now own our home free and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Talk about redemption, people. I blew off 25 years. Did you count it up? 12 to get in the mess, 13 to get out, to get back to point zero, to get up to that green line? 25 years right there. God can redeem anything, by the way. So, so what I'm saying is, now let's get back to student loans. Here's a rule of thumb that I didn't come up with. I mean, experts have said that this is something that, that we can really look to and count on. The total amount of debt you have when you finish school and walk out, graduate, how many more days? Not many. Should not be more than the annual entry level wages of the job into which you will be working, okay? So if you are going to become a first grade teacher and you leave school with, what, $24,000 of debt and where you plan to teach an entry level teaching job is $24,000 a year, you see what I'm saying? It's pretty reasonable because that's an amount if, if you won't do this big red splat right here, that's a reasonable amount that you can, you can get on a payment track, pay it back quickly, and stay on the green line on your way to financial freedom. But I can tell you if you leave with $74,000 in debt and you plan to pick soybeans three months of the year and kick back the rest of the time, it ain't going to work. Oh, that was a crazy thing to say. But you, you know what I'm saying? I mean, you, your aspirations, this career for which you are planning to make your life work, at least to get started, needs to match the amount of debt. And this does not mean that you go ahead and take as much debt up to that point. Oh, please, no. Never take more debt than you have to. Take only the least amount you can possibly take to get by. Then work, work, work. I don't know how many of you are working while you're going to school, but you need to. You need to have skin in the game. You need to be paying some of the money you're earning into the that office down there where they take payments, right? As for parents, I think this rule can apply as well, you know? Uh, people who are down here at, at, at this bottom of this red line here taking on big plus loans for their kids. You know, I have to go, it, it makes me really, really nervous because I don't know that there is a plan to pay it back, a good, solid plan. So do you understand rule number seven? And this can apply to any time you borrow money. A and just let me say, it's best not to borrow. It's best not to be in debt. If you must be in debt, you must pay it back as quickly as possible. And so those are my seven rules for life. So you ready for your test? I've got them. The business cards. You want to pass them out? See if you can write the seven money rules for life on the back of a business card. And by the way, on the front is how you can reach me. I hope you'll keep this card, and I hope you'll keep that illustration as well as a memory of our time together tonight. Because I tell you something, if you want to stay on that green line, if you want to get back on the green line, these are the rules that you need to take care of. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. I know it's not hard, especially if you took notes. It's open book. You can refer to your notes. <laughs> We have about we have about nine minutes for questions. Does anyone have any questions at all? I know you're writing fast. Yes. Uh, oh, ten, ten, eighty. That's percentages. So if you've got a dollar, let's just put it to a dollar into your life. I, th I think a good formula for how you're going to manage it is to is to is to save. 10 cents, give away 10 cents or 10 percent, and then use the 80 percent that remi remains to live your life, I mean, uh, for your lifestyle. And that's tough, but boy, is that a good, a good formula. And the sooner you put it into practice, the less likely you are to get over your head in other things that you're unable to do that anymore. Do you understand? Okay, great. Any other questions? Is it fitting? Are you writing too big? <laughs> is
Is this fun? Did you think that was great that I brought business cards for you to write on? Yeah, I thought it was too. It's my little gift to you. Good job. 100%. 100%. Everyone gets an A. You know, these are simple rules you can teach to your children. They're simple rules you can teach to your, to your grandma. <laughs> She'll be so surprised. What grade are you in, sweetheart? Third grade? I bet you could write them yourself, couldn't you? So do we have any other questions? Yes. It's like you're a plant. Like, like it's totally clutching you, like you need that pair of yeah. shoes or, or something like yeah. that. What, what are the things, like sure you can look at your budget, sure you can look at everything that, all your responsibilities, but what do you do in that moment? Like, this is easy, okay? It's only easy because I really struggled to get to this point, but I so understand this. First of all, I have a rule. On something like that, I have to pay it with cash, okay? Now... I know what you're thinking. Oh, you never bought anything at Zappos or Amazon? Yeah, it's tough. You can't use cash online. But just theoretically, stick with me here. But I have to do this all the time. I mean, I can walk into Walgreens, not need a thing, just kind of be hanging out with my friend and leave there needing about $98 worth of stuff. You know? First of all, you have to parent yourself. You have to get really tough. I had to realize that a true need is never realized while standing in a store. That's true, whether it's REI, whether it's uh, uh, a drugstore, whether it's Nordstrom, whatever it is. If you needed it, you knew it before you got there. So right there, all right? Now, I'm not saying that we should never buy things we want. Not at all. I mean, God has put things in our hearts. I mean, you know, he, he says, delight yourself in the Lord, and I will give you the desires of your heart. So we have desires. But I'll tell you something, if I don't have the cash to pay for it and I'm standing there in the store, I have, and I actually made a little flow chart that I put on my checkbook years and years and years ago. And I have to ask myself these questions, I call it self-talk. And then I go, the first question is, do I need it? If the answer is yes, then I go down to the next question. If no, then I go off to the side, which is the end, story over, done. I just saved myself from a stupid purchase. That's what it said right there. The next one is, if, if yes, I need it, do I need it right now? Or do I need this four weeks from today? Or do I have enough left at home? The next one is, yes, if I need it right now, have I found the best price? Um, well, if yes. You know, and there's another question in there, do I have something else that might substitute just as well? That one would get me every time. Because I already had shoes at home. You know, I did have something that would do just as well right now. That would work in the grocery store as well, you know? I mean, I can become impulsive any place on earth. <laughs> and, and so I would go through this whole thing, and the last one, if I got all the way to the end, you know, I need it, I got to have it, I don't have anything else. If, and this was my rule, if it was over $20, I would have to live by the 24-hour wait rule. I'd have to go home and come back later after 24 hours after thinking about it. You know how many times I didn't come back? It, it was like a spoiled brat child who just had to have a little tantrum in the store. Um, I would do this with the mail order catalogs as well because there was a time, believe it or not, where there was no internet. Even imagine, can you? No internet, nothing online, no email or anything, and we depended on mail order catalogs. And they were fabulous, were they? I'm telling you, that was hor Oh, man, I could do so much damage with, with mail order catalogs. I came up with this plan for myself, that I allowed myself to open the catalog and enjoy that experience and fill out, you know, everything I wanted and fill out the order form right down to figuring out the tax and the um, shipping and everything. And I would fold it up, put it in the envelope, and up in the corner underneath the stamp area, right there in the stamp, I would write down what the total was that I needed to write the check to put in. But I had to wait a full seven days. But then I was allowed to do it. You know, I, fantasy girl here, I would put myself in two <laughs> positions, parent and child, you know. <sighs> never once, never, ever once 
did I ever go back and buy? The funny thing is, is I could never remember what I'd even put on the order form. And it just showed me, you know, how weak I can be, but yet how strong I can be as well. So that's how I would handle that thing. But you got to do some self-talk, girl. You got to do it. We promise. And this doesn't mean, now if you see those great shoes, give up something else, you know. Start saving for it. There's one more thing that it just came to my mind. I want to make sure I say to you guys about student loans. When you get them, do you know, huh, this is, you're going to blow your mind, did you know you can start paying on them right away? That you don't have to wait four years and six months? <laughs> you can. Now, even if you cannot pay any of the principal, I recommend that you make it a rule that you start paying the interest. It's not that much a month. Just the interest. It might be $14. I mean, I, it depends on you know, the interest rate and what you borrowed, but it's not that much. And another idea, as uh, I know you're never going to believe this, but as a grandmother, yes, um, my little four-year-old Eli, when he gets to college, if he says, Grammy, would you pay the interest on my, you know, this month? Are you kidding? I'd pay it for him. So if your grandma sends you a check or says, honey, what do you need? Say, I need $14 for my interest this month. You know, grandparents might want to do that. But see that as a bill. Don't put that out of your mind. The interest is accruing. I know you don't have to pay it yet. Unless you have subsidized student loans, there is no interest until after you get out of school. But I doubt very many of you have subsidized anymore. Most of them are unsubsidized, and that is accruing interest. So start paying that interest. Another thing, keep track of where you are. All of you should know exactly how much you've borrowed so far. So this is not going to sneak up on you, OK? You need to do this, girls. Am I causing some problems? <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a wake-up call, isn't it? So that's what we want to do. Were there any other questions? We've almost come to the end of our time. Yes? It increases your credit score. And, and trust me, getting them can do well for your credit score as well. Um, because remember, a credit report says how credit worthy you are. So every time you make a payment on time, you're proving you are credit worthy and you can be trusted. So that, that's true. And when you do pay them off, yeah. Um, so I thank you all for coming. This has been such a delight. And, and something has just been staring me in the face since I've been standing up here. And I can't believe what I see on that plate, on that table over there, are some of my very old books. <laughs> Would you like another one for your collection? Oh, yeah. Do you have this one? You do now. I would be delighted. I don't understand how you have these very, very old books, but I'm so honored and thrilled. Oh, 2008. Well, you know, this goes back a long time, but this is your book right here. So now, I'm going to be speaking in chapel tomorrow. If I repeat myself, pretend like it's the first time you ever heard it. If I say something funny, Please laugh, okay? <laughs> you get it started. You don't want to wave, do the wave or whatever. That'd be fine as well. <laughs> and I'm going to hang around here for a while. If some of you have something you want to ask or talk about that's kind of personal and private, I'd be delighted to talk with you. And I did give you my email address. Did you notice? On the card. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.